Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sid, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm very happy and grateful today to be able to say that I'm a sober alcoholic. I'm also very happy and grateful to be able to say that many years ago, I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And at that time, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. Still struggling to do that every day, but I made that decision and I'm working on it. I'm also very happy and grateful to be able to say that on a daily basis, I'm seeking to improve my conscious contact with God as I understand Him today. Um... But it wasn't always like that, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Our topic today is one ultimate authority, and I want to try and stick to that that topic. I'm not just going to tell you about my life, except as it relates to that topic. One ultimate authority, and this obviously comes from the second tradition. For our group purposes, there's but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. And I want to say now that I absolutely believe that those early AA members, those guys that wrote the 12 steps, wrote the big book, wrote those 12 traditions, that they were inspired by this very same loving God that we're talking about today. Because they could never have put together all that without some divine intervention. And I honestly believe that without those traditions, as well as everything else, we're sticking to the traditions today, and tradition too, um, AA could not have survived. Because I want to ask you the question, who would have led it? if it were not for some ultimate authority, uh, or one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. And I want you to just try and imagine this with me. Picture with me, you take a group of recently sober alcoholics, a big group of them, maybe just out of a rehab or something, you put them together, you form a club, a fellowship, and you give them a task for the rest of their lives. And you tell them that they must work out this task, it doesn't matter what it is. And one of them says to you, okay, who's going to be in charge? And you say to them, you work that out for yourself. Imagine the chaos. Because, quite frankly, half of that group, after they've been sober for a short while, half of that group are going to want to be in charge, aren't they? Because alcoholics love to have a strong opinion and love to give that opinion. And most of us think that we could do the job better than anyone else. Have any of you sat in a pub late at night? Well, what do I mean? Of course you've sat in a pub late at night. You sit in a pub late at night or somewhere where there's a lot of alcoholics drinking and you hear them solving the world's problems, eh? We're very good at that. We're discussing the super rugby, we're discussing politics, anything. We sort it out, and each of us thinks that our opinion is the most important one yet today. And that comes back. You know, when we, when we stop drinking for a little while, we, we're shivering. Neville spoke at the previous meeting of guys that won't take tea at a meeting. They don't want to drink soup because of the way they're shaking. Once those shakes are gone, we turn into somebody, we turn back into those, what the big book calls self-will run riot. We turn back into those people. We want to take charge. We want to, our opinions are so important. You'll notice that you bring a new call, you see a newcomer at his first, maybe second meeting, and the guy that brought him there offers him tea afterwards or coffee, and he says, yeah, please, please, thank you. Anything, what, tea or coffee? Doesn't matter, whatever's easiest for you. So nice, eh? Milk, sugar? If you got, yeah, if you got any to spare, I'll, I'll have whatever you got. Six months later, he's saying, you know what, this Glen tea is rubbish. We've got to get twinings. We go back, hey, we become that person. So the first problem would be that everybody there would want to be in charge. Or not everybody, most of them. The second problem is that none of us would listen to those in charge anyway, would we? Alcoholics alcoholics are notoriously self-willed. So we wouldn't get it right. There is only one way that Alcoholics Anonymous could have survived at group level. And that is that if our ultimate authority is a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. But I believe that there's only one way for that to work. And that is if most of, at least, if not all, of the members of that group are working that program, are seeking a a conscious contact with the God of the understanding, have come to believe. If we don't believe in a God of any form, a power greater than ourselves, then as a group conscience, we cannot rely on that power. I remember walking through the pick-and-pay mall in in Winkelspreit on the south coast of Natal many, many years ago. Um, It was a few years before I came to AA, and it was about 10 to 6 at night. 10 to 6 at night, that's very important because the bottle store is closed at 6 o'clock. So I'm on a mission. I'm very, very focused, as you all know. 
I'd been working a bit late and, and my plans hadn't gone right and my booze cabinet was empty. So I had to get to the, to the bottle store as quickly as possible. But I noticed as I went through the, like the, a big open section of the mall that there were some trestle tables there with a whole lot of pamphlets on them and some signs hanging from the roof. And one sign caught my eye. It was a very distinguished looking gentleman, a photo, a large photo of this very distinguished looking gentleman, a bit like Chris with his tie out today. And it said there, a sober alcoholic, yes, it's possible. That caught my eye, and I was thinking about that as I went down to Solly Kramer's. And I was thinking about it simply because I knew at that point that I was powerless over alcohol. I would never have admitted it to anybody, not even myself. But deep down inside, I knew that my life was unmanageable. I knew deep down that I had a deep, a serious problem with alcohol. So when I was coming back out there and I was walking out with my, my packet from Solly Kramer's, my, my treasure, and I was walking out and, and I noticed something that nobody was going anywhere near these tables. But I thought, you know something, I need to get some of that literature. I need to find out what are they talking about here. It turned out that AA and Sanka had had a combined alcoholism outreach awareness, awareness outreach, or whatever you want to call it. And they'd all gone home and they'd left these pamphlets there. But I didn't want anybody to see me picking them up because, I, you know, this is my hometown. I don't want anybody to know I've got an alcohol problem. This is where I live. This is where I was kicked out the hotel for urinating in the pot plant in the foyer. This is a place where I can't go to work on a Monday morning. I don't want them to think I've got a drinking problem. Heaven forbid. So I stood looking in, a work, in one of the windows and nobody's around. And I shot over there, grabbed pamphlets, pushed them into my Solly Kramer's packet, and I went home, very happy with myself. And I thought, maybe this is going to help. A sober alcoholic, obviously it means he's drinking, but he's not drinking badly. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So I was sitting there drinking, reading these pamphlets. I know the irony wasn't missed on me either. And while I'm reading through these pamphlets, I got so disappointed, because all I read about was a power greater than myself. God as I understand him. Submitting. In fact, I read off one of the, the old preambles that's used all over the country. The simple purpose of the AA program is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than myself. And I thought, oh, no, man, just another religious program. And I took all the pamphlets and I threw them in a drawer and I forgot about them for a few years. Because you see, I was going to run my own life. I was going to make a success. My happiness was in my hands. I would choose what direction I'm going to take. Sound familiar? Many, many alcoholics have got the same thing. I still remember telling my, my, my brother, at my funeral, make sure Frank Sinatra's my way is sung. I was going to do things my way. So these pamphlets were not going to work. I'd grown up in a church at, with a church-attending family, and I wasn't going to go back to that again. I didn't need anybody's help. I didn't need a crutch. And I told that to my sponsor about four or five years later, when I'd been in AA for nearly two years, and I was still drinking. It was a bit of a, a mess up. I'd, I'd been on this bender, and I didn't know what to do. But I, I come to realize that I was one of those unfortunates that the big book talks about. I've been trying, to, as I say, nearly two years to stop drinking in AA, and I was still drinking. And I'd just come off a terrible bender. I was, having, I was looking for another job quickly because I was about to lose this one. My wife was initiating divorce proceedings. And when I was drunk, I was quite pleased about that. But yeah, I'll get rid of you, man. I jettison, I can, then my life will take off. I can remember standing really sick. I can remember standing after having made an amorous advance on my wife and being rejected. And I remember standing there, red-faced, bloated, overweight, bloodshot eyes in my underpants and my vest, and saying to you, you know what, if you don't want this, I'm sure there's a lot of ladies out there that would. <laughs> but the next day when I woke up, I was in a terrible state. And I went to see my sponsor, really to give up. Because at this point, I realized it's not going to happen for me. I'm not going to make it. And he said to me, he gave me actually three pieces of advice that night, because he didn't accept that this is the end. He told me he wanted to moor me. I do remember that. But he said, you know what? You've got to, I want to give you three pieces of advice. The first thing is, get to meetings. Every night, get to meetings. And I'll tell you what, if there's anybody here that's new in the fellowship, listen to these three pieces of advice. He said, get to as many meetings as you can, which was easy. I, I, I could do that. He said, if, you, if you're don't, not planning to go to a meeting tonight, ask yourself, why not? I said, okay. He said, and when you go to the meetings, he said, shut up and listen. That was easy for me. In two years, I hadn't done anything except read the big book, the chapter five. So I thought, that's easy. He said, no, no, no. I said, and listen. 
And that was a bit difficult. Because I didn't, I wanted to take what you people were teaching me, mold it, shape it to fit me, and then I would do it my way. And he said, no, no, listen. Listen to what they're saying. And if you're not sure of what he's saying or she's saying, go afterwards and share a cup of tea with him and ask him. He said, but the most important one, one ultimate authority. He said, the most important one, he said, take step two and step three. He said, find the God of your understanding. Submit to a power greater than yourself. He put it to me like this. He said, consider yourself like a bullied kid in a playground. The guy that's bullying you is far too powerful for you. You can't do anything about it. You need to enlist the aid of a power greater than him. And I discovered that alcohol was far greater a power than me. And I had to get a power greater than that. And that's what he told me. And I, I thought, okay. He said, and he gave me this. He said, listen, every morning that you wake up, get on your knees. There was a long time ago, and my knees still functioned wonderfully then. He had said, get on your knees and ask God as you understand him, or don't understand him, to help you to stay sober today. But okay. He said, and if you don't have a drink that day, when you finish, before you go to bed at night, do the same thing and thank him. God as you understand him. And I said, okay, I'm going to try that. I had nothing to lose. I, and you know what I was doing? I was postponing my next drink. That's all I was doing, because I knew it's coming. And I just thought, if I can just postpone it a few more days, a few more weeks, I'll try that. I'll try anything. And what actually happened is I stayed sober, dry, for a few weeks, and then it turned into a few months. The first eight days were horrendous. I don't have to describe them to you. You know what they're like. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep properly. I was shaking badly. One guy said I was shaking like an expensive dog. And then the, the morning of the ninth day, I woke up, and I can't explain it, but I felt wonderful. I really felt good. I suddenly I felt hungry for the first time. I, I realized I'd slept most of the night. And I would say from that day, things started to change. But I kept going to meetings, kept going to meetings, listening. And, and, and my sponsor, Roger, from, from Durban, he told me, do this for six months. After six months, start talking at a meeting, start to ask questions, get involved. And I thought, well, I'll do that. And oh, But that six months drew fast, eh? Before I knew it, I hadn't had a drink for six months. This is the first time in my life, well, since I was about 14. And six months came, and I went to my first to the meeting that night, and I thought, ooh, now I've got to say something at this meeting, and I really don't want to. And you know, I believe that the God of my understanding puts the right people, the right situations in place when I need it. That night, the, what we used to call the, the speaker, seeker, uh, chairman, and secretary, all in one, resigned from the group, and he said he wants somebody to fill in for him. And I thought, oh, no. okay, and I did it. And I believe that that made a big difference. Service, people, it makes a huge difference. And I got very busy. I had to go to meetings. I had to get busy. And uh, I remember having to go for the post for the first time at Doonside Post Office. At Doonside Post Office, all the post boxes are outside. And for some stupid reason that I don't know why, I always thought everybody knew that post box number 107 belonged to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I thought I'm going to have to go and collect the post in the middle of the night. The day that I went to the meeting, on the way to the meeting, I went to collect the post. I was feeling so good. And I wanted to just tell everyone, everything's under control, just getting AA's post. Don't worry about a thing, you know. <laughs> I was feeling so wonderful. And I'm telling you now, I haven't had a drink now. In fact, the 24th of April, it'll be 26 years. And I must tell you now that, thank you. From about the third month, second month, till today, I haven't had the least craving. Not one craving to drink. Because, and I believe that it's largely to do with depending on a power greater than myself and working every day to enlist the aid of that power, to enlist God as I understand him, and to come into a working relationship with him, which took the burden off me. And I, and I honestly believe that today that is what keeps me sober, as well as the wonderful fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, we're not saints. The book big book tells us we're not saints, but we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. It was a big disappointment to me. I'm coming back to the, the one ultimate authority. How do we run this whole group under the power under the, the, the authority of a, a power greater than ourselves. Well, I kind of, in, in the first year, I sort of looked at all the old-timers as saints. Saint Chris, <laughs> Saint Roger. You know, I really thought these were marvelous guys, and I thought that they wouldn't do much wrong. Until one day something happened that, that made me realize it's an go, ongoing process. Two newcomers came to our meeting that night. I was probably coming close to my first birthday, and I was getting very, uh, I was feeling wonderful. And... The one guy, I knew him from, from the pubs and from the street, the older guy, his, name was, his nickname was Rum Jack. Like when you get a nickname like that, eh? Rum Jack. And Rum Jack, 
put it nicely, he smelt bad. And he'd arrived there, and he hadn't changed his clothes, and he was dirty, and he, you know, a typical alcoholic that, that's come off the street. And he didn't have too many teeth, and you know, he was, was quite an unappealing kind of guy. He was the kind of guy you roll up your window at the robots for. And the other person that came in was a young lady in her early, like middle 20s, who, t- she told us later, she had actually been a, a lingerie model and a swimsuit model for, remember the old Scope magazine? And she was beautiful. And I noticed that night how the men were lining up in a queue to share their experience, strength, and hope with this young lady. But poor old Rum Jack was trying to make tea for himself. And, you know, and I just realized we're not saints. We're on a spiritual journey, and I hope that all, and I pray, and, I, and I'm sure, that all of those guys slowly changed. Um, but we're on a spiritual journey. But now I want to ask this question. Have you ever asked yourself? There's quite a few of us here to do, at this meeting, and there's lots here, and there's lots more. And, and every group, I've met literally thousands of people in AA over those years. And there are so many different gods as I understand him. And I actually, for, for my, my, myself, I work full time for the God of my understanding. So I'm very zealous for the God of my understanding. But how do we now say we've got all of these different gods of our higher powers, and yet we submit to one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself? Well, I want to tell you that I've never yet heard of somebody say, my higher power wants me to fail. I've never heard of anybody say, my higher power, the God of my understanding, wants AA to fail, wants me to do something wrong. The one common thing amongst everybody's God of their understanding is they want them to be a better person. They want them to go forward better. They want, so when every one of us is under the influence of that, a higher power that is wanting us to improve ourselves, to improve the group, and to take this wonderful message to alcoholics who still suffer, then we're all going to be influenced into a, a, a far more positive direction, aren't we? When we all submit to one ultimate authority, who's, we all agree, wants the best for AA, and wants the best for that still suffering alcoholic. Somebody mentioned a little bit earlier that, uh, that expression, things beyond my wildest dreams. When I came into AA all those years ago, some of the old-timers told me, if you stick to this program, you practice these principles in all your affairs, things beyond your wildest dreams will come true. And they have. I don't have to tell you much about my life before. You know what my life was like. Uh, I remember coming into AA thinking, I'm really going to shock these people. And I told them the worst I had, and they all went, hmm, yeah. You know, and then they told me their stories, and I felt like running out the room. Some of them were, they made me look like Peter Pan, some of them. And I remember coming across one man, Bob. Oh, what a, what a gentleman. What a wonderful man. Gentle-spirited. He had suffered many heart attacks and uh, a few strokes. He didn't make, take much part anymore in, in the things, but, but we became friends. He was about 40 years older than I was. And I remember taking him to a, a, a group in, in Seaview, no? Yes, yeah, Seaview in Durban. And I remember taking him to a meeting there and thinking to myself, you know, he told the story of the serenity of God coming over him at fishing at Chain Rocks. And he had lovely stories like that. And I thought to myself, you know, Bob, if you knew the kind of guy you're traveling with, you wouldn't want to be with me. You wouldn't want to travel in the car with me. I'm bad, you know. We get to the meeting, and one of the old, all the old times, so happy to see Bob. And the one gets up, speaks from the floor, and says, you know, it's so good to see Bob. If any of you really want to see what AA can do, look at Bob. Bob was South Africa's most, uh, SAP's most wanted man for many years. I thought, what? So I went to this guy afterwards, and I said, what do you mean Bob was SAP's most wanted, the South African police's most wanted man? Is that, did I hear you right? He said, yeah. I said, goodness me, what are you talking about? Bob, gentle Bob. He said, well, he wasn't always so gentle. He said, he did five years in, in John Foster Square for manslaughter, for murder. I said, really? What on earth are you talking about? He said, yeah. He, I said, how did he murder people? He said, he, he murdered five guys by riding over them with his car. I said, oh, was it an accident? He said, no, he had to reverse over some of them. <laughs> These guys were, you know, they made me feel like, right, I'm at the right place. These guys, because in those two years that I was still drinking in AA, I went from being bad, needing AA desperately, to being suicidal. You know those tick the 20 20 questions? Well, when I got into AA, I could probably still lie to myself about four or five of them. End of those two years, I ticked the, the, the being to jail, I ticked the divorce, I ticked all of those. We are not saints. But I'm not the same person anymore. And you know why? Because I personally submit to authority. I submit to a God greater than myself. 
And because AA, all of us here submit to one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Saint Sid. And now for our next speaker will be Deborah. Please. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name's Debbie and I'm an alcoholic. Yay. And I've sure never spoken in front of this many people before. Um yeah, the shares you've been hearing today um, come from people with 10, 20, 30 years sobriety. I'm not one of them. My sobriety date is the 5th of July, 2015. Um, I, first, <laughs> I first came into AA in 2009. Um, so it's, they say that, you know, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. I'm one of the sometimes slowly ones. I'm very stubborn, and um, I have a lot of pride, and it's taken me a long time to really surrender to this program. Um, the topic of, of our meeting is one ultimate authority, and I'm going to share my personal story with you because for me, until I did finally surrender to my one ultimate authority, my higher power, I was never going to stay sober, and I was never going to have any form of serenity or peace in my life. Um, okay, so... I come from a history of uh, depression, alcoholism, and addiction in my family. Um, at the age of four, my mother committed suicide, um, and that, that has affected me my whole life. Um, at the age of about 27, my father, who was an alcoholic, did the same thing. He shot himself, and a couple of years later, my brother died of a heroin overdose. So um, I was destined to become an alcoholic, but the problem is I was never, ever going to be like them, and I spent my entire life trying to be the strong one, running away from facing any issues, and um, unfortunately one can only do that for so long, and it catches up with you. In, um, when I was young, alcohol wasn't really a problem for me. I, I started drinking the usual as a teenager, um, but it, it wasn't really an issue for me. Uh, what I did was I, I chose to run away from life by getting involved with boys and then getting married. I got married very young at the age of 19. I then had a child at the age of 20. And I was very keen on starting my own life, starting my own family, and filling this hole in my soul, which was very much there and always was there. Um, by the... I think my son was about two and a half, and the restlessness and irritability started setting in, and I decided that I needed to find a new husband, which is what I did. Um, left my husband, and off I went, and I got married again, and I repeated the pattern again, um, had another child, and again the restlessness, irritability set in. Um, I was married to a man who was a lot older than me. Um, he didn't drink, um, which I think probably was my saving grace because there wasn't a lot of alcohol around. Um, he was quite a controlling person. So um, luckily in the years that my, my children were very young, I didn't drink very much. Um, had given half the chance, I probably would have, but thankfully I didn't. Um, Alcohol became a problem for me in 2007. My husband was killed in a car accident. Uh, we were coming back from Natal, and my daughter and I were in the car with him, and he, the car went into the back of a truck, and he was killed instantly, and her and I walked out unscathed. Um, that's when I turned to alcohol to cope. Um, I was petrified of facing life without... I mean, I'd never actually been without a man in my life. I didn't really know how to be alone. I was alone trying to bring up these kids without a dad, and I started drinking every night, really, from about 2007. Um, 2009, I checked myself into rehab, and more for a nervous breakdown than alcoholism. AA, we were introduced to AA, but there was no ways that I was anywhere nearly ready to admit that I was an alcoholic. So I spent three weeks in rehab, and I came out, and probably a couple of days later, I started drinking again, never really giving it another thought. Um, it seemed to happen in two-year cycles for me, because I was fine for another two years, and in 2011, 
I landed up back in rehab. Again, more for the mental side than, than the drinking problem. There, I spent three months in rehab, um, really worked the program, really thinking I worked the program. Clearly, I hadn't really ever done a proper step one. I came out of uh, the second rehab, and again, after a month, probably even less than a month, I started drinking again. Um, you know, my child, my daughter was about 12, 13 at the time. Um, she now is a member of ACCA and thankfully dealing with, with all the, the stuff that she had to go through with my drinking. But, you know, the poor child, you know, when they're that age, you can convince them, you know, you've just spent three months in rehab and then she sees you having a glass of wine and you just convince her that, well, it's okay. And, you know, what can a poor child do? They, they need you for their survival. So they just say, okay, but the damage that it caused has been huge. Um, so I carried on drinking. I then um, actually got engaged in that time, and um, there was a lot of alcohol. Uh, the, the man I was going to marry was quite a big drinker. Uh, he didn't understand alcoholism at all, and so he, I mean, yeah, he would often say to me, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I won't let you drink too much. And I used to think there's no ways that you can stop me from drinking. You don't understand. But anyway... It, another tragedy happened in 2013. Um, my 22-year-old son got shot four times in an armed robbery in Johannesburg. And he was on life support for 10 days. And that's when really, really, really I drinking. I just upped the ante on the drinking. I didn't eat for 10 days. And I just drank and drank and drank. The fear of seeing my son lying there in a coma for 10 days was something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But basically, he, he survived, and he has survived, and he's 100% perfect today, thank God. But when he came home, I basically, that's when I just realized I wasn't okay. And I went back into rehab for the third time. Um, and that's where I thought that I had got the program. I came out of rehab. I got very involved in AA. I did a lot of service. I sponsored people. I went to meetings. Um, I stayed sober for 20 months. Um, I was doing well, I thought. I was doing, my daughter was so proud of me. Everything was going well. I went and I did a spiritual walk in Spain. I, I, I mean, I, I even thought I was doing well. And there's a I, went, I went, went to my psychologist one day. I go and see someone twice a month. And I just said to him, I'm just tired of trying to be okay. And his words to me were, well, then stop trying. And the minute he said that, that gave me license to drink. In my mind, I thought, okay, I'm now going to go and drink. And that's exactly what I did. I went home. I made dinner for my child. It was all planned. And I... I fed her, and off I went, and I went and started drinking. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to have two glasses of wine, which is what I did. Started driving home, and that's when the insanity, that's when I, oh, geez, looking back, I mean, I am most certainly an alcoholic. No, why, why go home now? Are you crazy? So, yeah, that's, that started an eight-month um, relapse for me. A couple of months after I started drinking, I had it, I told my daughter I'd relapsed, but she thought it was a once-off. And um, But I continued to drink behind her back. And one day she actually came home, saw the alcohol in the house. She was uh, 19 at that stage. And she promptly walked out of the house and left home. Didn't talk to me for about three to four months. That was a massive shock. You know, I'd always said in my shares before that I'd never really lost anything through my drinking, houses, cars, children. Here was a massive, massive consequence. I had actually lost my daughter to, to my alcoholism. I tried to sober up after she left. I came back to AA, but I had a terrible attitude. I was very resentful towards AA. Um, yeah. I didn't get it right, even though she had left home. I, I didn't manage to, to stay sober. So I carried on drinking. Um, I have some very, very close friends in AHA who, who I used to see on a weekly basis. And, you know, they still supported me. 
I mean, I just, I just kidded myself and I kidded them. I kidded myself that I was okay, kidded them that I was okay. Um, but I was slowly going downhill. I was isolating. I was hungover every day. The self-loathing was just unbelievably terrible. Um, and for the first time in my life, I actually started getting scared because I realized that actually I was going to die. I never, ever had that thought before. Um, you know, they say we all must reach our rock bottom before we find recovery. And I most certainly had never reached my rock bottom before this relapse. I never had experienced the fear that I felt. Um, but I got to the, that point, that jumping off place they speak about in the book, um, where you can't live without alcohol and you can't live with it. I really feel that I got to that place. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, the last day that I drank um, was quite a surreal day. I spent the day with my neighbor, and I had been out with my brother the night before, so I was extremely hungover. And he had actually just sat, sat me down and said, you know, he had never really seen the extent of, he had never seen me drunk, actually. And he had actually said to me, you know, you really are an alcoholic. You need to stop drinking. So I knew deep down that I had to, had to, had to stop. But that was a Saturday night. So the, this was now a Sunday, and I decided, okay, I'm not going to drink again while I was driving home from his house. But slowly, slowly, the thought started coming. But you've still got wine at home. So just finish that, and then then tomorrow you can stop. I believe that if I had done that, I wouldn't be standing here to, today. Um, so I, I, I really feel that my higher power stepped in in a big way that last day. Um, I spent some time with my neighbor, who's, who's a, a Christian person, and she said she was going to go to church. And for some reason, I just knew that I had to go to church with her. Not that I was going to find salvation or anything, but just do do the next right thing. Um, so I committed to going to church with her in the evening. Um, I then went upstairs, and I was washing dishes, and there was the alcohol sitting, standing there in front of me. And I, it was almost like I was faced with a choice between life and death. That is how it felt. Thank God my higher power gave me the strength to choose life because I poured the alcohol down the sink begrudgingly. I didn't want to, and... Um, I went to church that night, and the next day I went to an AA meeting. I dragged myself in there. I didn't want to be there, but now I, I had no choice. I knew that I, I was defeated. If I wanted to live, I had to go back to AA. Um, that was nearly nine months ago. Um, I'm very grateful. You know, I don't, I don't regret the past, like one of the promises. You know, a lot of people think that the years of sobriety are so important. For me, it's not that so important. It's more your quality of sobriety. I have a much better, deeper quality of sobriety this time. I have a proper step one. I clearly never admitted or accepted I was an alcoholic because now, standing here today, I know that I can never drink again if I want to live. It's just not an option for me. My step three is very, very strong. Because I know and I feel that my higher power certainly saved my life. I know that, I feel it, and every day, the more I surrender, the more my higher power works in my life. It's not always what I want, but it's always what I need. Um, my relationship with my daughter has improved dramatically. Um, whether it will ever be the same or not, I don't know, but I'm just thankful that She's part of a 12-step program, so she can work through her stuff, and I can work through mine. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't think of anything else I wanted to say at this point. So I think I'm just going to end it there, and thank you for letting me share. Thanks, Deborah. Sorry about the... you got three minutes more, you know that. And, and uh, now for Peter from Port Elizabeth. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, friends, um, family, visitors, and those who came for a message. I hope I have something to say. Um, normally, when the committee phone you, 
I'm never eager to put my name onto a list, you know. And then the committee phoned me and asked me to share. And normally you say yes, no problem. And then after that, you start worrying now until you get here. And, and I don't, didn't have any fun up to now. But I'm sure after this sharing, then things will happen for me. It's a constant, you know, thing that weighs you down. I'm not sure why it is like that. Any idea, Chris? And now I was depending on this man to take the topic forward. And here he starts sharing about his own personal uh, story. And then, uh, shame, I couldn't depend. You, you, uh, how many? Not so long in the fellowship. And now I'm not sure whether the pressure is on me or must I leave it to you. <laughs> but it's between the two of us. I said, good afternoon, my name is Peter, and I'm an alcoholic. I had to write down here what I want to say, because um, being a trustee, I've seen guys that, yo, they know their stuff, oh, and you feel so small. Uh, but I'll try there what to, to um, if it's not on the right track, you need to uh, see me after the meeting. Right. I would like to thank the committee, though it uh, caused so much anxiety. I would like to thank you anyway, you know, for asking me to share. And um, being an uh, 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 eager person, I always say yes. And then afterwards I said, what did I let myself into? And I assume we're moving now into the second uh, session of the of the graveyard shift, which is a terrible shift. I mean, when you have some food in, um, the eyes want to close. Okay, if you want to sleep, it's fine. But please don't snore. That will just... Uh... Our theme today is uh, tradition two for our group purpose. There's but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Now, I had, my father was an alcoholic. Now, he was our ultimate authority at home. Um, whenever he drinks, then uh, all hell breaks loose at home. And he was somebody that was brought up. He supposed to have become a priest in the Catholic Church and... Um, that's what his father wanted him to be. And you know, these things I handed down to you. You know, when he's drunk, then I have to say the prayers while there. And then he forgets he told me to say these prayers. And then he called me again to say prayers. And oh, and I, you know, it wasn't good fun. And make coffee and all that. Then I had, had to hear about all the things he had to do. And he always said when he was drunk, honor your mother and your father so that your days here on earth might be long. Now, we were very poor. During the cold months, winter months, we used to drink antifreeze just not, not to, to survive, you know, to survive because we didn't have much clothes, you see. So antifreeze was a thing that we drank that kept us warm. Now, eventually I became an educator. Now, die are to say so drunk to a clear lung on her racer. And um, I also became a drunk teacher. It was very scary because you don't know when you see the parents of these kids, you know. Uh, and being a, a teacher, eventually becoming uh, the headmaster of that school, I knew I had to discipline difficult learners and tell them where to get off, suspend them. And here I come into AA, the ultimate authority is a loving God. And all of a sudden there's no bosses here and you get difficult customers coming in, these newcomers, you know. They give you a hard time. And there's no some uh, uh, disciplinary action that you can get against these guys because... I mean, if these guys were students, they would have been expelled already. But now you can't 
there's no punitive measures here to get these guys, and these guys are vindictive, man. So difficult customers, these newcomers, very frustrating. Uh, for this headmaster, I couldn't do anything to them. Spell them, neither hand them their arrears in pledges, or blacklist them, for that matter. You know, because ultimate authority is a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. And in the group conscience meetings, these guys are sharp. These guys are sharp. They sort you out. So that is what the tradition tells us, that God is in charge. Um, and he's a loving God. So he forgives us our mistakes and he guides us on the right path. So there's nothing that I can do to to discipline these guys. God want the group, want the group um, to that the God God says that the group is more important than me, myself, the individual. I listened to Akim that he said about uh, it's just me, me, me. No, it it didn't happen that way. So this tradition is actually the glue to to our future because. Um, this loving God goes across cultural ba uh, backgrounds, different countries, and this is the glue that keeps us together across racial boundaries, color, creed, and even religions and cultures. It's truly amazing to, to uh, comprehend that. Sometimes you think that AA is going to fall and something is going to happen. Terrible is going to happen to AA, you know. But then you find out, no, it doesn't happen that way. I had to realize that we are but trusted servants and that we don't govern. In step three, I had to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him. He will then guide me and my group to grow and, put, and take us forward. I have to realize that my primary purpose is to stay sober, just to stay sober, practice these 12 steps, and to help other alcoholics to ch stay sober. Therefore, I had to carry the message, give away which was so freely given to me. God has given me this wonderful gift of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous with a purpose. And you know, in the Eastern Cape, Port Elizabeth, um, there's so few members you have to duck if they want to have elections or what. It's inevitably you. So it's a scary situation that you end up with portfolios that you know nothing about, you know? And you have to go to Joburg and now still have to say something decent. It's, it's hard work. But anyhow, um, the first position I took on was the GSR. That was okay in the group. Working in the group, that was fine. I was the link between the group and the district, so that was fine. Then the group secretary, and then eventually, after 10 years of ducking and diving, I became the chairman of the Port Elizabeth district. And then afterwards, I was the delegate. And this is where all the fun and games started. You know, we were part of um, a breed that they call the, I almost say hashtag must fall, uh, the, no, not that group. It was the blood on the wall group. My word, I didn't know what was happening to me in that year, but there was, there was, I was, I was swept and uh, psyched up. And uh, we were called all sorts of names, but believe me, I was just an innocent victim in the wrong place at the right time. But I'm still termed today as the blood on the wall group. You've been there. And there's a man here also. We normally went to the conference, and then I had Robbie, the happy alcoholic, as a, as a, as a roommate. And when I want to go to the conference, uh, I found out that I was locked in 
you know, these are the things that happened to me. And then I was summoned uh, as a delegate on the red carpet. I had to please explain. We normally have our George uh, forums, and then I had to explain uh, my abstentionism, and uh, I'm not serving those portfolio in the in the right way. You know, the easiest way is to quit. And my sponsor and my my mentor John C said, "No, you stick, you stick." And I didn't know then they couldn't have fired me, you know. So um, we had to get um, a mediator from Cape Town to come all the way to PE by plane. We had to cover his cost. I'm not sure what Leon's uh, surname is, but Leon from Cape Town, he was the, 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 the um, trustee at that time. And then we had to ride all the way to Plettenberg Bay to have this uh, big meeting to discuss uh, this delegate that's not doing his work according to the service manual. I thank God today those days are gone. And I survived that. There was no hashtag must fall, otherwise I would have been gone that time already. But then, you know, people forget about your, your performance. They went forward and they nominated me as a trustee. Now I was nervous. Oh, my word. Uh, when is this thing going to, uh, to stop for me, man? Uh, where's the other members that can take these portfolios that are more clued up? And the literature, they know everything about AA, you know? Uh, but God saw it fit because he's a loving God. He's protecting me through all the storms, you know. And today I can say it wasn't easy, but it was worth it. Uh, God saw it fit for me to go through all these trials and tribulations and uh, curveballs and uh, raining on my parade and uh, doing all sorts of funny things to me because they say God have a good sense of humor. You know, he, he knows his way. So, um, luckily, I'm so grateful. I, I'm rotating off in May, rotating off, and they cannot re-elect me. That's a nice thing about it. They cannot call a poem upon me again. But then they went further, and they didn't have a chairman for the P district, and um, who do you think they opted for me why I don't know but uh, I'll see later on what God is uh, why God do this right um, then it also says that we are but trusted servants and we have a funny way of promotion we are promoted downwards according to this triangle, Chris, you know, the membership and the groups are right on top, and uh, we trusted servants are at the bottom, you know, so uh, that is the way it is, so the groups have more say, it's not a, it's a servant position, I must ask myself, am I here to serve or to be served, and definitely I'm here to serve, right? Then, um, in my eager days, you become, um, you know, you get all the portfolios that the group want to throw to you. You must do GSR work, you must do this, and you must do this. And all of a sudden, too many portfolios come your way, and you are called Mr. AA, and you are called the boss, the CEO, and all those funny things, you know. I can imagine now, I'm just throwing this around now. Imagine you establish your own company. Obviously, you're the CEO of this company. And all of a sudden, new employees and members come, and one day they decide to have this group conscience meeting with you, and they say, no, uh, I don't, we don't think you are a fit enough CEO, so they reduce your status. Imagine how resentful you will feel 
It's your own company. You the you the founder of this. Imagine it, it happened to you in a group, you know. So there are two things that you can do, and luckily those guys sent me the, the literature um, in the 12 by 12, and it says there you can become a bleeding deacon because now you're resentful. You know, you've done everything for this group, and you tell yourself, I contribute so much money to this group, you know. I go the extra lengths for this group. I do this and I and I and I, you know, for this group. And look what they've done. They reduced me to nothing. So I have two options now. I can become resentful, according to the literature, and become a bleeding deacon. Now they have a nice description of this guy. I love this description of the bleeding deacon. They say... In uh, tradition two, describe this bleeding deacon as one who is just as surely convinced that the group cannot go on, go along without him. You know? He is the end of all and the beginning of all this group. And believe it or not, hulle gee die groep net a maand om te bestaan. Dan gaan hulle fold. This group is going to fold. Because after all, I've started the group, says the bleeding deacon. And guess what happened to the group? The group flourishes and more members come in. And then you start thinking, I wonder if I was standing in the way of the growth of this group, you know? So this bleeding deacon has resentments, you know? Can look at his face, he's never happy. He is never happy. He's got his break quart, his dug back. So he's consumed with self-pity, they say. The bleeding deacon is always referred to things that you don't fix things that are not, not broken and all sorts of things. And the loving power of God, the ultimate authority, uses that authority in our group conscience. So the groups actually need to have their business meetings to discuss, you know, are we still on the right track with this group? Are we doing, carrying the message to the soul suffering alcoholic? Or are we just here to, for personal glory? It is not about me. It's not about, uh, that person. It's about the group conscience. What is good for the group? The other option, uh, which is a very, very good option that uh, literature describes, is the elderly statesman. And I've seen many of you having just that calm, and 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 I've, I, you know, I, I'm like a sponge. I, I draw strength from you guys that show those qualities. There are many of you in this, these rooms. So why did I decide to just come back? still come back after 24 years, it's because of the example that I see in these rooms. The elderly statesman they describe as the one who sees the wisdom of the group decision, holds no resentments over his reduced statements. Um, his judgment is sound and he's willing to sit quietly on the sidelines, patiently awaiting developments. So we must choose the right one here. Do we want to be the, the bleeding deacon or do we want to be the elderly statesman? So that is where I draw strength from the literature. There's also the min minority uh, opinion that is protected in this fellowship by this wonderful ultimate authority and loving God that keeps this fellowship on track. It's almost like the lady talking to me um, when I go somewhere. The lady will always tell me, and I call her Auntie Mona, uh, 500 meters, turn left. 500 meters, turn left. And if I don't go that way, then she's very upset with me. She tells me, make a U-turn, make a U-turn. And then um, I know that I haven't followed that GPS. So the minority 
decision is also protected in the fellowship. And um, in the vision for you, when I came in, I did not expect that I will last so long in this fellowship. I just came to save my marriage. Really, I just came to save my marriage and get my wife off my back, you know. Um, I wanted to drink, but I wanted to drink in a, in a, in a proper fashion. And on 152, a vision for you, uh, it, it says there, you are going to meet these friends in your own community. Near you, alcoholics are dying helplessly like people in a sinking ship. And I was in that sinking ship, and I didn't know that I will be saved. If you live in a large place, there are hundreds of them, high, low, rich and poor. These are future fellows, fellow alcoholics. Among them, you will make lifelong friends. And, and really, I've made many, many friends in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Many, many friends. It's a pleasure to go to rallies and conventions and Really, you meet those guys there. And you will be bound to them with new and wonderful ties, for you will escape disaster together, and you will commence shoulder... There's two lights on. Which one is it? And you will escape disaster to, together and you will commence shoulder to shoulder on this uh, common journey. So it did me good to eventually say yes to the committee in order to educate me from, from uh, a deeper sense into, into that tradition. You know, it was, it, was, it was not nice while I was drinking because I thought, man, uh, I was the life and soul of any party, and my wife really told me, uh, you are the fool, man, they're laughing at you, you know. And and I really thought that uh, the party, people loved me, man, for my jokes, you know. So um, my wife was, uh, you know, she was in a bad place. She had to write letters eventually to... Uh, to uh, Okay, 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 I'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, give me another two minutes, I'll be there now. But my wife, um, you know, had to suffer this guy that did not want to stop drinking. I'm sorry that I went overboard, yeah, man. Uh, um, but uh, God eventually saved me from myself, and um, I'm in AA today because I want to be here. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Peter. Sorry I had to press the red light, both lights. And now we ask Leanne, please, from all the way from Rondebos. It's got it. <laughs> Good day, guys. My name's Leanne, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hate public speaking. But, um, yeah, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Um, as my sponsor explained it to me when I, when I first got sober and as I've experienced it over the years, that um, any time Alcoholics Anonymous asks me to stand in and to be of service in any way, it is, it is truly an honor and it's a privilege. So thank you very much. I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to all of you that have been on the, con the convention committee and put together this today. Um, we see, like, the MC running around, but we don't see the guys at the back, you know, um, Jill. Paddy, um, I know Tammy was on that committee, Vaughn, you know, and a bunch of others that I can't think of their names right now, but um, a big thank you to everyone. Um, it's really been quite, an, quite a beautiful day. Um, my sponsor tells me that any time I speak in AA, I, I am to introduce myself in a, a set way. I have a sobriety date. It is the 16th of May, 2010. I've had, um, I have not had anything that affects me from the mind up or the whatever. Not had any sort of form of mood or mind-altering substance since then. Um, I have a home group. It is Rondebosch on a Wednesday night. It is, my opinion, one of the best meetings in Cape Town, and you guys are all welcome to come and come visit us at some point. 
And I have a sponsor. She's sitting right there in the third row, Ariana um, from Green Door. You know, and it's, as I understand it today, I need these three things in order to stay sober. Um, I'll get into a little bit of what it was like, what happened, what it's like now, and how, and try to tie in the topic. Um, I'll probably stutter a lot, but when I got sober, I can string a sentence together. So the fact that I can speak up here is, is a huge uh, thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, alcohol for me, I thought it was my problem. I've come to understand it, that it was my solution. You know, it was the one thing that when I had a few drinks, um, it took away those barriers that blocked me off from you guys. Because I could always watch everyone else, and it was always as I was sitting on the outside watching people, the kids at school play, um, my friends at college. And I could never understand how to be a part of, but give me a few drinks, and I'm, you know, none of that stuff existed anymore. I've come to understand that as that being part of my spiritual malady, you know, I'm selfish and self-centered to the extreme. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I started drinking pretty young. I got drunk. I, I had my first drink at three, half a glass of champagne for New Year. <laughs> I remember what the bubbles tasted like. I remember vomiting and passing out, you know, and for me, that was a really great experience. Well, yeah. Um, I didn't drink alcoholically from then, but I started drinking quite regularly from, from eight. Um, I thought it was very normal for people to steal a bottle of, of red hot rum from the, my dad's cabin, you know? Everyone my age did that, uh, I thought. I've come to understand today, and the big book tells me that I have delusional thinking, you know? Um, and when we came back to South Africa, I thought everyone put vodka in their, in their water bottle at school. You know, who didn't? Um, yeah. At 18, I, I went and <laughs> I had a slight little problem, and I kind of wrote off a car, and my parents gave me the opportunity of a three-week holiday in a rehab. And if I did that, I could get a, get my car fixed. That's not exactly what they said, but that's how I saw it. You know, and I wasn't one of you guys because <laughs> I'm 18, and the guy, the meetings I went to, people were, no offense to anyone, were way older than me. You know, I listened to the things that people spoke about, losing careers, losing the car, the house, the wife, the husband, the kids, the dog, the whatever. I'd never lost any of that. I kind of messed up a car, you know, and I was here on holiday. Um, and yeah, it, it took me two and a half years to get sober. So I got sober when I was 20. Um, and in that time, there was, there was a guy, funny, who, um, who I'm really grateful for. You know, the big book talks about the only person who can speak to a still suffering alcoholic that I can listen to is someone that's armed with the facts of, my, of their disease, you know, and armed with the, with the facts of the solution. You know, and this guy spoke to me about, you know, he explained my disease in a way that I'd never really heard. You know, I've always listened to people losing cars and wives and husbands and all that stuff, you know, that I'd never lost. You know, but, but finally spoke to me about, about the disease, you know, the self-centeredness, the spiritual malady, the physical allergy, you know, the stuff of when I start, I can't stop. When I stop, I can't stay stopped. And in between all that stuff, I'm always constantly obsessed about Leanne. What are you guys thinking about me? <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> am I going to have enough money? Am I pretty enough? Am I clever enough? Am I good enough, you know, that whole long thing. Um, and yeah, I, I came to AA not because I was one of you, but because I, I wanted to, to listen to this guy a little bit more, and he introduced me to my first sponsor, a lady, a lady named Jill, um, and he told me that, you know, you guys, you need to work with her. Um, and this woman was very different to me, you know, I came in here with a black and purple mohawk, I only swore, I couldn't string a sentence together, I used to stutter, I still stutter. Um, and I used to dress it from head to toe in black. You know, I, I wanted you guys to be scared of me. And this woman was the complete opposite of me. Any of you who know her, she's quiet, <laughs> never swears. You know, she's got the bob, the pearls, the red lipstick, goes to church on Sundays. Um, but she had something that I wanted. She, you know, she had what, she was comfortable with what she had. And she seemed calm and serene, you know, and that, that was something that I couldn't understand. And I really wanted that. So... Yeah, I, I kind of followed what she told me to do. Um, when, when you talk about one ultimate authority at the beginning, I misunderstood that. I thought that was my sponsor. You know, it was, it was the guys from the first, the first AA meeting I went to. You know, and I wasn't one of you guys. I was going to celebrate, when I, when I celebrated a year, I was going to have a draft. You know, that was my plan. Um, and somewhere along the, along the way, I, I caught alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I started to realize that the external stuff didn't matter. You know, and, when you guys spoke of, um, you know, that whole thing of when I do things my way, even if I get my way, it's not necessarily what I want, you know, that I need to hand my will and my life over to a loving higher power, you know, and what I understand of that is none of my business, you know, it's just something, it doesn't matter, as long as it's not me and it's more powerful than me and as, um, as long as I try to understand it, like, you know, if I can put it in a box, it's not big enough to solve my problems, um, 
and I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> There's a lot of you guys here today. Um, yeah, oh yeah. And the only reason that today I understand, the only reason I want to understand that, that God thing, you know, I, I, I like the way the book talks about God because it's short and sweet and simple. You know, and the only reason I want to understand God is so that I can control it. If I know the rules, I can break them, you know, and I can get away with it. Um, and as a, as a result of, I suppose, of working the, the steps outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, following the rule of the, the directions in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have been awakened to, to a life beyond my wildest dreams. You know, all the promises, not just the step nine promises we read in meetings, but I think there's over a hundred promises. I haven't exactly gone through and encountered them all, but there's pretty much promises for every step. Those have come true to me in my life to a certain degree, you know, and it's, for me, the biggest thing that gets in the way is me, you know, because I seem to think that I'm that ultimate authority, <laughs> you know, and the speaker before me, he spoke about the elder statesman and the bleeding deacon, you know, and my experience is that I have to go through them, you know, I have to go through the, oh, I have had to go through the bleeding deacon thing to get to an elder statesman in certain areas, you know, in some areas, especially around my home group, I seem to jump between the two and that's okay. You know, I get to experience my, my life as, as, as my perception is, you know, as how connected I am to, to, a love, to my loving God. You know, when I can suit up and show up and do his will, my life's good. You know, even if it's things that I think are stupid. You know, um, even if it's things that make me feel really uncomfortable, standing here in front of a whole bunch of people, not one of my most comfortable things, you know. Because um, I stutter and I don't always say the right thing, you know, and I've got this, this obsession with looking really good. You know, like I've got it together and... That's not my case, you know. Um, and from the people who've spoken today, I'm pretty much a new. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, one of, I'm, I'm a baby still, you know. I'm, I'm coming to the end of my sixth year of sobriety, and that's way longer than I ever thought I could stay sober, and it's way longer than I wanted to stay sober, you know. But by doing this stuff, I've been, I've been introduced to a new way of life, you know. Um, and I love the thing, the reading that the Twelve and Twelve talks about on, on tradition too. That the highest, or Sue said it today earlier in her speech that the highest thing I can get to is servant. Because I came in here and I, I looked at guys and I was like, I want to be you guys. You know, the guys at the areas are like, I want to be the, the trustee, the delegate, the whatever it is. Actually, no, that's a lie. I just wanted to be the chairperson at, at meetings, you know, and I wanted to share because then I wanted to look that I, like I've got it together. And that's not, that's not the case. You know, for me, the highest thing, like Sue said, is, is to be a servant. You know, the, the stuff that, that's, I suppose, following in my higher power is well for me, you know. And I don't know what that looks like. But the vision for you says that it's kind of to be happy, joyous, and free. And for me, I get that by being useful, by serving, you know. And I suppose as long as I follow those, those lines, you know, as long as when I go out, and I get this wrong a lot. <laughs> you know, my, my sponsor will, if you speak to her, she'll, she'll she's probably nodding right now. I see she's laughing. You know, I get it wrong a lot. I cause, I get Leanne's ego stuck in the way, and I think that my way is right, and I become the ultimate authority in, in certain things in, in my life, and I tell people that they're wrong. <laughs> Um, and the difference for me is I get that feeling in my gut, that feeling that says, yeah, you're being an idiot. You know, and I, I would like to read a message. Um, when I got sober, my parents had disowned me. You know, they wanted nothing to do with me. And I, I told my dad I was speaking here today. Um, and he sent me a message at 3.58. said, thinking of you, go for it, love you lots, your dad. You know, and, I'm, and we're really proud of you. And of what you've achieved over the past years. I personally, I don't think I've achieved very much. I've just managed to somehow get out of the way just enough so that God can work through my life. You know, and as I get to do the stuff so that I can be an example. You know, and yeah, there's guys out here today, guys like Funny and Patty and Jill and Ariana and Elise and Chris, you know, and many others that I'm not mentioning right now because I'm really nervous and I've got a terrible memory. Um, but they're the guys that have that thing that I want. You know, that freedom, that, that freedom, that serenity. You know, and <laughs> I thought that they just got that because they were sober a long time. But that's, that's not how I understand it today, you know. For me, it's watching those guys. You know, they get it by getting out the way and, and having one ultimate authority. You know, loving God is he may express himself in the group conscience. And I've come to understand that when it's me and my partner in our relationship, you know, sometimes it's just the two of us and God speaks through him even when I think he's wrong. You know, my sponsor, even when I think she's wrong. So um, I've got the red light. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for asking me to speak today. Um, it's always an honor and a privilege to do service in Alcoholics Anonymous, and thank you for my sobriety.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.